Hey guys, how's it going? I'm back here with another video and today I'm going to be bringing this video where I'm going to be going over the new changes that come with the newest version of Next.js. I've been meaning to make this video for a while now and that's why I'm excited to bring this for you guys. The reason why I waited a bit is because I wanted to let the changes marinate for a bit, let myself enjoy them and understand everything properly in order to fully bring this video and I know you guys have been requesting this for a very long time now. So if you want to check out the code we're going to be writing in this video, I'm only going to be focusing on the new changes by the way. So if you want to check out the code for that, it's all going to be in the description. And before we get into the video, if you could leave a like and subscribe, I would massively appreciate it because it would help push my videos to more people. And that extra like that takes you basically no time to, to leave uh, actually helps me massively. And I would really appreciate it if you could do so. So with that in mind, let's get into the tutorial. Okay, everyone, so let's start with the video. So to start this off, I really want to just first show you guys how to create a Next.js application, because there has been some changes in the creation process. So uh, I wanted to show this to you guys. So first of all, you guys have to obviously install the create uh, next app um, a package inside of your system, you have to install it globally. And when you do so you just come over here to any application, I'm going to be using yarn in this case, but you can use npm as well. Of course, uh, I'm going to just run yarn, create next app, just like this, then it will ask us to um, respond to some questions. And this is where some of the changes appears. First of all, it's going to say what is your project name. So I'm going to put just a dot over here, because I want to create this project inside of the current directory that I'm in. So I'll just press enter. Then it's going to ask us, first of all, do you want to use TypeScript for this project? Uh, I'll say yes, uh, but I won't be focusing it on TypeScript at all. Uh, would you like to use ESLint? I'm going to say yes. Tailwind CSS, let's say yes. And then it's going to ask us if you want to use the source directory for this project. So um, currently with Next.js, there's going to be a folder called the app folder. And um, this can either be inside of the source folder, or just as its own thing. So I'm going to by default, it says yes, so I will return yes. And it will then ask us if we want to use the app router. So there is two different types of routing that we can have in, in, in Next.js. Now, um, the app router is a recommended as you can see over here. And by default, it says yes, and I'm going to show you guys how to work with it. So I will press enter as well. Then would you like to customize your import alias, I'm gonna say no, and it's going to start installing all of our um, Next.js stuff. So I'll wait, I'll wait for it to finalize. And I'll be back in a second. Actually, while it is installing, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Turbo Pack, which is one of the first changes that I wanted to introduce in this video for Next.js 13. So what Turbo Pack is, is basically an alternative to Webpack. Um, so Next.js 13 now it's using a new build tool, which is this one over here, it was built this build tool turbo pack was completely built using rust, as you can see, which as you guys might know, it is a very powerful and fast um, language. And according to uh, probably some research done by the next JS team, and probably some research done by the turbo pack team, uh, this over here is 10 times faster than using Vite and 700 times faster than using webpack. I personally haven't tested uh, or try to benchmark these numbers, but I do believe them. You can see in the Turbo Pack uh, website, it does uh, show a comparison of like how Next.js 13 um, acts and how fast it is when using Turbo Pack compared to its other versions. So like for different things that you can do um, in your application, like a cold start, it is way faster than uh, the previous versions of Next.js, including um, the current version of Vite. So it is a pretty good change if uh, a Next.js application is built really fast and, and with a pretty efficient um, service like this one over here. So that was the first main change, but it's not something that developers will really notice unless they want to make a lot of customization into their project. I do think um, it will become hard as we as we go through because a lot of people are used to using Webpack and also n no one really knew Turbo Pack before this. I, I like some people probably knew it, but I personally never heard of it before. Um, so to make any changes or even just work with Rust, it will be kind of uh, complicated. However, I do think 
Um, this is a step in the right direction. It is way faster than Webpack, as they even mentioned. It being 700 times faster than Webpack is, is outstanding. So uh, this was the first major change. So the next uh, change will obviously come with a code. And as you can see, we successfully created our Next.js project. And the folder structure for Next.js is, is obviously uh, pretty similar to how it was before. We do have this source folder and inside of it, there's an app folder. This app folder is where all of our application will exist, right? So we have over here, by default, we have a couple of things, right? Just a normal boilerplate, um, like code when you install a create next app application, I'm going to run this application. And obviously to run apps in Next.js, you just run yarn dev. Um, we'll hope that it will open up over here. And as you can see on our local 3000, we have our next application, right? So what I wanted to talk about first is routing, because this was probably one of the biggest changes. And it's I actually really enjoyed the way that routing is done in XJS 13. Um, so I wanted to show it to you guys. So first of all, if you want to have routes in your application, and to do that, I'm actually going to come over here and delete all the stuff that already came with uh, Next.js. And let's create new routes in our app, right? You can see our app is completely empty right now. Imagine we want to create an about page, right? So if I were to do this, in this version of Next.js, I would create a folder called um, about just like this, right? And then instead of this, I would create a file called page.tsx. Now I'm using TypeScript here. If you're using JavaScript, obviously call this page.gsx. However, it is important and really important for you to call it page because this is how Next.js will identify that this is supposed to be a page, a route. And the way they're going to get the name of the route is based on the folder, as you can see over here. So over here, I would just export default, um, like this default function, and then put the name of a function, we can call all of these functions just page if we want to, but we can also call them about and I would call it this way, because um, I do think uh, it matches, it's easier to search for code later on, if you're calling it specifically what the page is about. But in this case, we'll just keep it like this. And then obviously return some sort of UI, I'll return like a div. And instead of this div, I'll put a, a header tag saying, this is the about page. Then if we save this, this is done. It, it we don't have to handle any routes, anything like that. We don't have to create an external folder. Um, just to keep all of our routes, everything is created this way, we can just come over here to our code and go into the um, about route just like this. And you'll see that it is displayed exactly what we put on this file. So this was a major change into um, Next.js. It isn't it's just a different way to approach this. It, we obviously with Next.js, we even in the previous versions, we didn't use something like react router DOM, there was already some built in running system for it. However, it's just some changes that I think are pretty cool, especially because there's a lot more than you can do with this. Like if you wanted to create a nested route, right? So if I wanted to say, um, I want to build two different routes that are extensions of the about route, I would come over here and create a folder called for example, Imagine we want to have a website where it's it has an about page, but in that about page, it can either be about us or about someone else, right? I could create about us <laughs> like this, and about someone else, or I'll just say someone. And those are two different routes that are going to be nested inside of the about route. So I'll just put over here page.tsx, like we did before, and here the same thing. And then um, we would obviously just come over here and copy this code and export some sort of component inside of this ones. Uh, so I'll say this is about us page, no about someone um, else page. And this one is the about us page. And we can change this to about us. And this one to about someone else. Now, just like that, we can come inside of our website. And if we will go to the slash about slash us, you'll see it will say this is the about us page. And if we went to slash about slash uh, someone, you'll see that this is the someone else page. So it's that simple, no extra configurations, it's all done like this. So obviously, if you wanted to do something like use dynamic routes, like have some sort of params, all we'd have to do is inside of like, for example, our about page, imagine we want to have an ID or something like that, I would create a folder called ID. Um, just like this. And then instead of here, I would create obviously, again, the page.tsx. 
and copy all of the code that we had before. But now let's call this about with params or with ID. So now we can get some ID from the params, right from the URL. And to get those params, I'll just grab them from the props, just like this. And then we can come down here and say that this is the about page with uh, ID equal to, and then we grab the params and say dot ID, because we have to, this will be an object and ID will be the variable that we're trying to get from our params. So I'll say something like this, and this is TypeScript, so we'll be complaining about this. So I'll just set the type to any for the purposes of this video. Then if we come over here and we try to go to the about page slash five, you'll see that it will say this is the about page with ID five. If we went to about slash six, it would change to six. So this is dynamically changing based on the URL. Uh, I do think it's screwed up with, uh, no, it didn't. It still set us up. You see that although we have params for the about page, it doesn't mess up the other routes, the other nested routes that we also had inside of this application. We can still access the us route and the someone route. There is more to routing that changed as well, but I will introduce the other stuff later on in the video uh, because it will correlate to what we're talking about in that part of the video. So now what I really want to talk about is a little bit about layouts, which is actually pretty cool. It's something that you can do to uh, establish the uh, structure of your website. So you see we have over here a bunch of routes, right? We have the about the about us the about someone we have a bunch of routes that technically, if we are in the homepage, they can't be accessed, right? And the normal thing to do would be to create a navbar for this. But where would we put the navbar? Well, I'll create over here just a simple navbar. I'll create a components folder and create a navbar component. So I'll say something like navbar dot TSX. Here, I'll just export that navbar component. And here we can just fill this up with um, links, uh, which are actual components from Next.js, but we can just import it by saying import link from next slash link, just like this. And we can just use it over here. I'll just create a link for all of the uh, routes that we have so far. So we have one for the about, uh, we have one for the about us. And one for the about someone else. Obviously, it's more common to have different routes, not not all routes about being an about page. But then in the link component, we can just put an href, which is going to be the link to where we want to go. So obviously, I want to go to slash about here, I'll do the same about us. And here the same thing. So now we have this navbar, right? But how do we display this navbar inside of every single component, we want it to be above over here, no matter the route, we want to have access to this navbar in every single route in our routing system. So the way we do it is we come over here to our layout.tsx file. And here we have a lot of really cool information. So the root layout is a function, which we can use to determine how we structure the actual HTML of our website, in the sense that over here in our body, we have uh, the children, which is technically all of the routes that are being displayed, all of the components that are being displayed will exist inside of here. But if we want to put a nav bar that is rendered above the all of the other routes, so it's always in the website, no matter what, we can just put it over here, just like this. And you'll see that no matter what, this uh, nav bar is appearing. And if I click on this, it will keep changing the routes, as you can see, right, I didn't put actually one for the home page. I'll do that really quickly. Right now, by just saying home, and doing this. So it's really cool, right? And we can do we can do a lot of stuff with this, we can actually also add a footer, right? I'll just add a, a text called footer, but you'll see that this will also appear at the bottom of the website, no matter which route you are in. So this is a really cool thing, the root layout, and there's more to this file specifically, that I can I want to talk about, but I'll talk about later on in the video, especially the part related to metadata. And the reason why I want to keep that a little bit to the side for now is because one of the main changes with Next.js is the way you fetch data. And it's actually extremely important. And I really appreciate the changes that they made because I think it will make Next.js easier, simpler and more efficient in the long run. So first of all, uh, I assume you understand the distinction between a client component and a server component. 
Obviously with Next.js as a whole, one of their main, the main reasons why you would use Next.js is the fact that it allows us to have server side rendering, which has a lot of benefits, uh, which have been talked about endlessly in the past. The fact that with server side rendering, you have, uh, you facilitate um, search engines to find your website due to the fact that the bots and website crawlers that are trying to find keywords in your website, they're able to find what your website is about when you have server side rendering. Because with client side rendering, which is what normal create react tab, for example, does is it has an empty HTML file, just a single HTML file. And when you enter the website, it will download all the JavaScript and that JavaScript will put all of the keywords and information that your website is composed with inside of that HTML file. So by default, before you get into the website, there's nothing in the HTML file, which means that website bots, like a search engine bots will, won't see anything in the website and that website won't rank higher in something like Google, right? So server side rendering prevents that. And also on top of that, because you don't have to download all the JavaScript immediately when you enter the website, there's that extra efficiency in the beginning, right? So that's something really good of about server components and server side rendering as whole. And now by default, all of the components in Next.js are server components. This facilitates notation, in my opinion. With previous versions of Next.js, you had to use functions like get static props and get server side props, uh, but we don't have to anymore. And that's something that I know people in the past when I made videos about Next.js uh, always complained that they didn't really understand what was happening. So now the notation is completely different and I think it's pretty well maintained now. It's pretty well self-explanatory now. So as an example over here, I'll create another route and I'll create it um, a route called list of posts. And this route will include, we're gonna make an API request to an API which will give us information about posts, like posts on Instagram or on Facebook. So to do that, we'll come over here and say page.tsx, just like this, and again, export everything. Uh, wait, let me just copy one of the pages and export the component. Let's call this list of posts just like this. And let's add the list of posts to our nav bar. So I'll just grab this, uh, call it probably just posts and change the route as well. So what we want is to make an API request to this API, which I'll leave the link in the description. It's a free API, which just gives us like fake data so we can test inside of our projects. And the way we're gonna do this is we actually can create a function up here called get something like get uh, posts data, just like this. And we'll make this function be asynchronous because obviously we're making a request using the fetch API. So we'll come over here and say const res to get a response from the API request. We'll say await fetch and we'll put the link to the API inside of here. Like I said, I'm using this API called JSON placeholder typeycode.com. Uh, I've used it in a previous videos. I think they're pretty good because they just, it's pretty simple and easy to just test their endpoints. And um, I can get a list of a couple posts, which is pretty nice. But I'm gonna get that response and I'm gonna return like this, return res.json. Now, how do I access this data inside of our application. Well, since this is the new version of Next.js, what I can do now is I can actually make this function be asynchronous. So like the component is asynchronous, which is something that we haven't seen previously as, as being used as notation in React. And over here, if I want to grab the list of posts, I'll just say posts equals to await get posts data, just like that. And we have access to this post. And obviously, we can just loop through it because it will be uh, a list. So I'm going to say map and then post. And I believe it each post in this API just has like a title. So I'm going to say, uh, just return back uh, some sort of like paragraph saying the post dot title. And this is TypeScript. So it will complain, I'll just say that this type of this is any and whatever, let's check to see if this is working. I'll go to the posts. And you can see a list of posts is being displayed in our screen. So as you can see, we were able to fetch our data in a server component without having to use the previous notation that we had before. And this is great because we can actually uh, fetch multiple data at once, like I can actually create 
another function over here and try to get user data, right? So I'll say users data. And this API does have a users um, endpoint as well. So let's try to get both of them at once. The way we're going to do this is actually, I'm going to say promise, uh, I'll actually the notation to get two pieces of data at once is we'll first try to get the posts and then the users as an array like this, and then say promise dot all. And over here, we'll have um, an array just like this. And we can put the um, the functions over here to request the data in the order that we want to receive on the left. So we're fetching two different APIs or two different endpoints in the same server component, um, and receiving all the data in minimal amount of code, right? It's it's actually pretty clean the way it writes uh, right now. So actually, with this users, I don't want to display them, I'll just console log them. So you guys can see that it's working. We'll see over here, we'll refresh, we still get the post data, which is good, because uh, it means that that request is working. And with the users, I'll just actually display them over here at the bottom. I'll just add a list. Actually, I'll just display their names like this. I'll have a div and I'll just loop through the users dot map. I'll grab each individual user like this and then return over here. Again, the P paragraph and display the user. I'll just get the name of each user. If we do that, and I also set the type to any, we should check over here to see if both requests were done. Uh, I think they were because you can see at the bottom of here, I do get a couple of names of people. Um, and it is 10 users that are returned in the API. So it is working, right? We get the posts and we also get the users. Now, there's a lot more to this. So this being a, a server component, there's a lot of things that we can do and a lot of things that we can't do. I would say a server component would be mainly used for for example, fetching the data, right? Uh, just like we're doing over here, uh, because you can't use some of the um, stuff that you can do with a client component. For example, over here, I can't put a button, right? I can't, I, I can put a button, obviously, but like, I couldn't come over here, say, click me, and put an on click over here. Because this wouldn't be part of what a server component can do. This is like a browser, uh, this is part of the browser API. So if I were to do something like this, you'll see event handlers cannot be passed to client component props because uh, over here, we're not inside of a server component because over here, we are, are inside of a server component, so not a client component. And there is a distinction between both of them. So you can't do something like this. Server components are meant to be run on the server, right? It's the whole purpose of it. So. Um, you can't have browser stuff in that. But um, you can work around this in the same way that this can not work in, uh, in a server component, you can't also use stuff like use effect and use uh, state or any any client side hook from react instead of this kind of components, it would just tell you the same error message. So then you have to be able to understand the distinction between what are the purposes of a server component and a client component. And I'll show you guys also how to fetch data in a client component in a second. So one important thing to notice is that uh, since this is a server component, and the way that they behave is the fact that when you fetch data like this, uh, all of the data is being cached static. So we this is almost like by default, we're using a uh, get static props, which is one of the, the ways we would fetch data in the previous versions of Next.js. And with this, the data is all cached static, which means that um, it wouldn't be good for a use case such as uh, one where the data is constantly changing. An example would be this API I found, which fetches data, random photos of dogs. So it constantly gets randomized, right? So you do need to, whenever you refresh this page or whenever you load this, this component, you want to fetch this data again. So uh, this over here specifically is something that uh, I would probably require this to be um, not static. So what I want to do over here is I want to create a new const a new function. And let's say get dog data, just like this. And I'll put this API over here. And the difference is the way we actually structure this because if I were to just put this over here, just like this, and we're to also get the dog. Uh, so I would just put dog over here and put the get dog data function over here. If we were to do something like this, and we were to display the picture of the dog, so I'll put image, which by the way, the way you, you work with images in Next.js, um, 
we would come over here at the top and import uh, the image component from next slash image, just like this. And if we were to display this, we'd come over here, display the image component and pass in uh, some information. For example, the dog um, URL. If I check the actual API, you can see that it comes with a message, which, yeah, the message is the actual uh, URL. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here, say image, pass the source of this image, and the source will be the dog dot message, just like this. If we were to display something like this, uh, oh, yeah, it's asking us for an alt. Uh, it's just for purposes of obviously accessibility. I'll just say dog just like this, save this, then you'll see that over here, it is missing. Okay, it's missing the width and the height. Okay, yeah, it's just because the image component is kind of annoying sometimes. So I'll say 300. And the height is 300 as well. So let's check to see the API working. Oh, yeah, this is actually something I forgot to tell you guys, which is actually really cool that it happened because it's important for you guys to understand. Uh, with Next.js, what you have to do when you have images that are from a different website, so like from an API, for example, you have to set up that it accepts that domain inside of your next.config.js file. So we have this object over here, I would put images, just like this. And then I would say domains, and this would here include an array of acceptable domains. So in our case, the domain we want to accept is images.dog.ceo, right? So I'd come over here and say, uh, images.dog.ceo. And I believe that this would work, as you can see, but it's a missing required components. Okay, it still worked, as you can see. So we do have to specify which domains are we accepting It's for security reasons. Obviously, uh, we don't want to be accepting uh, stuff from other domains without actually specify which ones we trust. But in this case, we do trust this API, and we do have to configure it this way. So we over here have this picture, right? And it's working perfectly. But what we want is to whenever we refresh the page to change the picture, because this API returns a different picture every time you fetch its data. But since by default, the fetching is static, you see it is caching the data, and it's just showing the same image. But if I want to change this image, so request this every time the, the, the component or the page is reloaded, we have to come over here. And at the top, uh, where we make the get dog data, we add this object called, uh, obviously, the cache, we set the cache to be equal to no store. And this will allow us to refresh the page and make the API request again, every time we uh, refresh the page, which is perfect for us. Now there's even more that we can do with this, for example, revalidation, uh, you can come over here and set a property called next, which is obviously just existent in Next.js. Uh, and this property, we can put a revalidate value. Now, what this will mean is we can reevaluate what the request is at a certain interval. So, for example, if you're over here, and we want to fetch this dog data, but we want to keep like, we don't want you to keep fetching if you keep refreshing your page, we actually want, uh, if you refresh your page a bunch of times, in a quick su succession, we want to keep the same image, maybe you refreshed by mistake, and you want to still keep the same data that it was before. So we can set an interval over here of how many seconds we want to actually fetch the data again, so make another request. So if I were to come over here and put three seconds, you will see that if I come over here, and I refresh the page, we have this one, but if I keep refreshing, only after three seconds, it will actually fetch a new dog. So just to again, show you example, I'm going to refresh the page, it's going to show me a picture of a new dog. But I'm going to keep clicking refresh. And you'll see the picture won't change. But after three seconds, I shall give myself more time, I'll give myself 10 seconds. So let's test this. I'll refresh this over here, we'll see a new dog. Uh, I can click refresh and the dog won't change. It will only actually request after 10 seconds, as you can see. So we got another dog, I can keep refreshing, it won't change. But after a while, like 10 seconds, uh, it hasn't passed in seconds yet. Yeah, you'll see I, I'll get a new dog. But this dog for some reason, the image is not displaying. But yeah, you get what I mean, right? This is what the revalidate actually does. Now a cool thing you can also do with um, fetching data, which I've actually mentioned that I was going to show it to you guys, it's related to routing as well, is the fact that we can actually create uh, what is known as 
error and loading components inside of each page. So we have this list of posts page, right? Um, imagine that there's an error in any of this actual um, like APIs, right? For example, imagine in this one over here, the guest post data, I were to just delete this. And obviously, this will throw an error because it should throw an error, right? This is not a legit API to be fetching data. So as you can see over here, it will give us an unhandled runtime error because there was an error in the fetching. Now we don't want to see this, right? We don't want to display this to the users, we want to display a customized message saying that there was an error. Now the way we do this with this version of Next.js is we can actually just create an error.tsx file inside of this route. Uh, and then obviously copy the, the component, there was an error loading the data or something like that, right? And um, to make this work, this has to be a client component, it can be a server component, because obviously, why would we this be an, a server component if it's an error message, there was an error fetching an API, we don't want to fetch data inside of an error uh, component, right? And you'll see that this uh, will actually not work. It says fail to compile, which is a different error message, because now it is trying to display our error component that we just created, but we need to turn it into a client component and not a server component. If you recall, by default, all components in Next.js 13 are server components. And if you want to turn them into client components, meaning that are components that um, you can, I don't know, use the on click method or use use state and use effect, you just come over here at the top and say use client, just like this. And now this will work. So it is infinitely <laughs> doing something. So as you can see, it now displays the error uh, message. Now it's infinitely trying to uh, fetch the data, which is something we definitely don't want. So I will come over here and actually replace this back to what it was before. But one thing that is actually cool as well, is that there's also a loading component that we can put you can just come over here and say loading.tsx. And I'll just copy what we put on the error page, paste it over here, call it loading. And let's say that while the data is loading, I just want to say loading dot dot dot. Now, if we were to save this, you'll see that if I refresh this for a brief second, it should show loading. But I do think it takes actually a longer time to load. So what I'm going to do is I'll remove this over here. And I will remove this as well and just make this be um, cache no store, like it was before. So this has to refresh every single time this I'll remove, I'll remove this as well. We just have the dog into this API. So that means that technically, we just have to say that const dog is equal to await get dog data. And then I'll remove all of this and just keep the dog image being displayed. So now if I were to come over here, and I were to refresh this, you should see a loading state for a few seconds, and then the data is fetched. So the loading component is indeed working as expected. So now that we've gone over everything that I had to say about fetching, um, I want to revisit the idea of server and client components, because I do think it's a major change, not only in Next.js, but it was a cha major change in the latest version of React as a whole React 18, uh, with the introduction of server components. And I want to explain because this use client thing is, is just a small step in, in, in this whole um, deep dive that you can have in this whole pool of information, um, in this new way to structure your Next.js applications. So the idea is that um, obviously the difference between a client and a server component is that a client component is main its main purpose is to act as a intermediate between the user and the actual client, in the sense that inside of the client components, you can do stuff such as um, browser events and um, react hooks and react not logic stuff. Um, whilst on the server components, it allows you to render your components, your react components in the server, which further decreases the amount of JavaScript that you have to send to the client and load in the client. So it's a it's it's just that both of them have different purposes. And just the way that react was before where all components were completely rendered in the client. Um, it made it such that you can be as efficient as possible by this di dividing your components into server and client components. Now there, there's some rules that you have to follow if you're going to use a server or a client component in uh, Next.js. So like I said, uh, there are a couple rules that you have to follow when dealing with server and client components. First one is you can't import a server component 
into a client component. So that's, that's straight up a rule that you have to follow, but you can pass a server component as a prop or a children to a client component. So uh, to in order to know when to use each of them, I would say this is a pretty good overview, like you would use your client components when you want to use react hooks, when you want to use browser API stuff like event listeners and, and, and stuff like that, which is a lot. Whenever and whenever you're using a custom hook, or depending on like, uh, the lifecycle methods of your react application. Uh, and you want to use a server component whenever you're passing sensitive information such as like API keys and stuff, or when you're making like API requests such as that. And when you need to access backend resources directly, which again, relates to everything I mentioned about fetching data. And when there are large dependencies, because again, remember, you want to, you don't want to just make all your components server, because I don't even think you could build a website directly like that, unless it's just this plain data and not having any in interactivity. Um, and you have to know that there are benefits of using client components as well. It's not just server components are the best thing in the world, they are going to help with Next.js applications and react as a whole. And I think they're going to stay here for a very long time. But it is important to understand when and where to use them. So this is basically it, there were new changes that I didn't uh, talk about. But because I think this were in, this ones over here are the main ones, I am going to make a video on SEO, like how SEO changed in Next.js 13, probably this week. Um, so I'll be talking about the metadata API, a lot of those stuff, if you want to check that out, I'll probably link that video when I post it to this video. But this is basically it for the video. I'm really enjoying Next.js so far. I know it took me a while to make this video. But it's just because I was really trying to internalize everything and learn everything as, uh, as at my own pace. Also, you guys know, I had a lot of work this semester graduating and finishing my studies. And I'm happy to be making Next.js content, because I will be releasing a Next.js course for beginners, like straight up, uh, I'm not assuming you know React, I'm not assuming you know anything, it is a full on Next.js course that I will be teaching to you guys. So stay tuned for that. It will be my first uh, paid course that I've ever made, uh, other than the ones I've had on, on other platforms, but it will be fully mine. So uh, it won't take away any time from the videos I'm making currently. Um, it's just on top of that. And I'm really excited to do that. So Thank you for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like down below and comment which one is in next. Subscribe because I'm posting twice a week and I'll be massively appreciated. And yeah, that's basically it. Really hope you guys enjoyed it and I see you guys next time.